Let's cut the music. All right. So, yeah, I am streaming early this week. Um, so I just um, I I got free time for a change. Uh, so work uh, has been hectic lately with everybody working from home. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been nonstop meetings. Finally, those meetings are starting to settle down. Maybe because I've blocked my calendar for certain times of the day. Uh, so I need to work on some samples for my ebook and I need to get this stuff done. So I figured why not just turn on the stream while I hack away at this. Um, so it's kind of office hoursy, but, um, yeah, I'm going to be working on my book samples for a little bit. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, let's see. How do we say this? There's no hyphens in that name. Top swag code. That's how I see it. Top Swag Code, welcome to the show. That's why I'm streaming on a Thursday. It's Thursday? Is it Thursday? I can't remember what day of the week it is anymore. Can you? It's one of those. It's one of those years. I'm just going to say it. It's one of those years. Yeah. Thursday. Um, okay. Okay, Visual Studio. Stay up for me. So I'm kind of working through some examples for my, my Blazor book my ebook um yeah yeah i've got notifications popping up here really stop it stop it notifications all right so working on my blazer ebook the ebook's out um the ebook is out but i am building the code samples uh again i've built them in private before uh, as I built the ebook out, and I have not published them, published them yet to the public because I wanted to do some of them on the show, and um, the book took a while to write, so some of the samples might have changed, and I'm kind of validating that they're all perfect inside the book. So I'm going to get the book up on the screen here in just a sec, and. Um, hit the next chapter. We did the first chapter the other day. We built a 
um, weather forecast uh, widget type of thing. And that is out of one of the very early chapters in the book. And uh, it turned out well. Uh, the project is now online. I will push the uh, thanks, Chicken Wang. You know, thing like a Chicken Wang, you can read the book. I uh, appreciate that. Um, if you need a link to the book, there is a, again, it's free and it's down. If you go down, scroll down, it should be in the bottom of the page. It should say free ebook and that link should take you there. Just click on the image. Um, it's uh, it's all it's going to cost you is your email. And I promise we use it for good. We, uh, if there are any updates to the ebook or any um, materials that go along with it, we will send you those uh, using that email. So uh, we, we try to be helpful and not like spam you and all that good stuff. So let's see, Git, GitHub. If we go to GitHub. I have my samples up there so far where, where I just left off. And I'll paste that link into chat here as soon as I can get it up on my screen. Uh, a little, what is GitHub doing? It's coming up like a responsive mobile site. My resolution is not that small. What is it doing? All right, here we go. Repositories. Wow, people found that quick. There's already folks um, starring that. So here we are. All right, this is the repo I'm working out of. And um, there's not much in there yet, but you will find the first uh, component basics chapter is done in there. And I'm going to go ahead and open up my ebook so I can follow along. Let's see if I can do this on the right screen. I don't want Edge. Who uses Edge? No, Edge is good. Actually, I'm not logged in on Edge or I'd use Edge just because I don't want to have two browsers open. All right, I'd rather have two browsers open. I'm not signed in. Ignore the man behind the curtain momentarily. There we go. Now I've got my ebook. So I should be able to scroll down here. Uh, let's download this, get it out of that type of view. I want it in a, in a PDF viewer. It's a little more natural. Then I can go through the bookmarks. There we go. That's much better. So I did the Blazor Component Basics chapter the other day. I want to focus on code behind today. Um, I think there's still some misconceptions as to how this works. So let's go through this. Uh, first thing is I'll point out I have two examples up in the project. So far there is a Blazor uh, server and a Blazor WASM. So book server and book wasm are the two projects in there. And uh, they're basically the same exact examples, but using server side and client side, there's very minimal differences between those two things. But I thought it was necessary to go ahead and make those just so people could see how that looks. And I'm going to open up the fetchdata.razor uh, view here. And yeah, Jedi Security, three three different browsers open. I see see seen some people using the Brave browser. Um, I don't know if that's any good. I might have to check that out sometime. I may reinstall Firefox. I have to check out Edge soon. Um, I'm just uh, I get stuck with something if it works. I don't replace it. Chrome works. Um, I I use a little bit of everybody's stuff. So Google for browser, Microsoft for development. Uh, the only thing I don't really use a whole lot is Mac stuff. I don't own Apple devices. Those are for my kids. Uh, they like those for some reason. Firefox Dev Edition sounds great. Um, I heard Firefox works exceptionally well with WebAssembly too. All right, so I've got fetchdata.razor open. I need, what I wanna do is do the code behind approach for this 
And when I mean code behind approach, this is all explained in the book really well. Um, we're going to use a file for component markup and a partial class for our code behind. Uh, so it looks like this right now. This is the fetch data. And what we want to do is eliminate all of the markup and put it in another file. So the first step is we want to create a class. And I'm going to go into pages and I'm going to say add a new class. <laughs> Sam is uh, not brave enough for the brave browser. I don't blame you. It's, you know, every time one of these things comes up, like Opera was a big deal with, with a very vocal minority, and then all of a sudden it went away. Uh, I think it's still out there, but it's not quite the same uh, as it was. Uh, Firefox is the best browser for WebGL. I don't do any WebGL work, but um, if I was going to play some games, I'd have to check that out. So we need a class. I have a fetch data dot razor. What I need is a fetch data dot razor dot cs. So that will give me a code behind. The reason for this naming convention, we'll zoom in on the name here. I need a fetch data dot razor dot cs. The um, the name here corresponds to the component here. And I'm adding dot cs at the end. And I am very bad at drawing with this thing, but that's a dot cs. So if I use that convention, we'll see that it it nests nicely underneath of fetch data and fetch data dot razor is right there. Um, and immediately I get these underscored squiggle things. What we used to do, and I'm going to say used to, I'm emphasizing used to. I've gotten some feedback on this recently uh, from people that have downloaded the book. The book is correct. This is what we used to do, though. We used to say inherit from component, uh, if I spell that right. Oh, come on. Component. Um, component base. This is how we would used to have, you know, before have done this. Uh, that is no longer the best convention to do this. So instead, we're going to say public stat, um, sorry, public uh, shared or partial, sorry, partial, public partial class fetch data. So we have our partial class. So now that underscore is gone. If we actually, let's go back and review that error again. So what was it complaining about? It was complaining that uh, partial modifier is missing because fetch data is already another declaration that exists for this type. That's because fetch data.razor gets compiled into a public class fetch data. So we already have one of those. We, so if we create another one using public class fetch data, we got a little collision there. So we need to make sure it is a partial partial class fetch data. So now that's going to link those two um, classes together. So now we have a partial class of fetch data that is our code behind and the partial, partial class that is our markup. Uh, and now that we have fetch data.razor.cs as a partial class, we can eliminate this code block. We can move up to this and paste that code here. We don't need the code block portion anymore. And we're going to end up with extra curly brace. So let's format that. You notice we have some underscores. We can clean these up with a little control period action. Control dot is going to give us our IntelliSense to import our namespace. And then we also have um, this git JSON async. So it's missing uh, the HTTP client. Uh, so let's see, control period using ASP.NET components. That brings in that namespace. 
let's go ahead and clear these up. We'll do a remove and sort usings. And there is a happy code behind file. Now, this, this is able to stay private. Uh, before, when this was a inherit inheritance model, you had to make it protected. Uh, that is no longer the case, so we can leave that as private. And we also need to bring our inject. We could actually leave it here. It's fine here. Uh, I think for code cleanliness, though, I'd like to see the inject be on the code behind side of things. So we need to move that over here. And in order to do that, we need to figure out how it gets injected because there is no inject directive in the same regard of uh, an at symbol inject. So we have to use something else here. So I'm going to do inject directive this way. Uh, we need to bring in our namespace for HTTP client. So control period again brings that in. And then this is going to turn into a git set property like that and that is all covered here in the book so we created this code behind file we migrated our code brought in our namespaces we added our inject uh, the example here is using server-side blazer I'm using client-side blazer so it's uh, weather forecast service and not HTTP client in that example and then we should end up with a nice side-by-side -side view like that. So let's give this a check. And we should be able to take this and say new vertical tab. We'll reduce our screen down like that. And now we can see our code side by side like this. And this for me is a lot cleaner and easier to manage. And I also get um, the control period uh, IntelliS uh, or Visual Studio tooling uh, that lets me do like code refactoring and all that good stuff and adding using statements automatically. Can't do that in Razor code. Just doesn't work. So the engine doesn't support that. Uh, so we'd move our code to a code behind. Now we have that support and everything's all nested into this little tree here and we can collapse that down get it out of our way and that is chapter um, I don't remember the number but that is the chapter on code behind just that simple um, so hopefully folks that run into this um, that have experienced the other code behind approach of using inheritance um, get to see that uh, things have been updated um, and it's done a little bit differently now. So question from the chat room and some, some other stuff here. Uh, fuel, uh, snab Snabble, uh, thanks for the feedback here. Uh, you tried something like this in your to-do list app, uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, been working on the live coder conference, nice. Can't wait to see how that turns out. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chicken Wing says, "What? What was the thing you just said? Wasn't su wasn't support on Razor side? Oh, uh, so if I'm over here, let's let's do this. Let's break this on purpose. I'm gonna break that on purpose. So we're gonna get nice red underscores there. If this is in our if this was in a Razor file." I would have to manually go add using statements, at using, whatever. In here, I can say control period, enter, and my using statements just come up. Uh, again, control period, using statements added, control period. I can do this nice and easy inside of a CS file, but not inside of a Razor file. So there we go. It's all fixed again. It's a really nice uh, feature to have available. It's a Visual Studio thing, and um, it's not supported in Razor at all. Just a uh, control period won't do anything. And um, this also helps with formatting a little bit. So good stuff there. Uh, thank you, Fuel, for... Um, 
following the show. Appreciate that. Uh, if you are not following the show already, hit the follow button. You'll get updates when I go live. Um, I try to keep a schedule of every Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time, but uh, things are crazy right now. So I decided just to go live today at 3 in the afternoon um, just because I need to get some stuff done and why not broadcast it. So that concludes that, that chapter. I've got both of those wrapped up nicely. So I'm going to go over to Solution Explorer and I'll push those up to GitHub. Or not Solution, Team Explorer. Um, uh, let's see, where are my changes? Changes, added code behind example. So code behind examples are now there. Push that again. Uh, let's see, is my chat bot working? What version of Blazor is this for? This is the latest and greatest. Let's see if my chat bot's responding today. Boom, there's my GitHub. All right, uh, yeah, so latest version of Blazor. Uh, silly Porridge, nice name by the way, like that. Um, Slurry Dev says, uh, 17 months of working from home. Now I'm on furlough. Oh, that sucks. Uh, unfortunately, that's kind of a growing trend lately. Um, sorry to hear that. Um, don't know where you're from and what you're doing, but uh, there are a couple positions open at Progress for sales support engineers. So uh, if anybody is... Oh, you're getting 80% of your pay for doing nothing. Well, shoot. Um, if you go to progress.com slash careers, uh, there are a couple positions open for remote right now. Uh, it's our job, job bite page. Uh, sales engineers are uh, something that uh, I think people that watch the show could possibly be interested in. Uh, this is like making demos and helping close deals by uh, showing off uh, like uh, ASP.NET and JavaScript apps and whatever else that we're trying to close deals on. So that's a, that's a thing if folks are looking for work right now. Make sure you get over there and give us a, a CV or resume or whatever. Those are remote positions. I don't know if they're hiring outside the U.S. or inside for all of those, but something to look at. Uh, what was the link? It was, here, I'll put it in the chat. Progress.com slash careers. Um, there's other stuff in there, but sales engineer, I think, is probably something that uh, people watching the show might be interested in. All right. The next, oh, no problem. No problem uh, at all. Um, so we're going to look at data binding next. And we're going to build a, a very simple example of how to do data binding. So let's create something. Um, so in this example, I use a page called Converter. And we'll open this up, and we're going to add a new page. So add new item, Razor component. And this component is going to be called um, converter. And we're going to build a simple um, data or uh, a simple inch to centimeters conversion tool. So let's start looking at how that's done. Uh, I'm going to open up converter and we've got nothing in here so far. And we're going to start very basic. So let's put an input on the page. I'm going to copy these out of the book because I want to make sure I haven't missed any little bugs or anything in the samples. Uh, so I've got input. The value is not one, and we're going to have a numeric input. And uh, we'll go ahead and just spell this out for everybody what it is. That, that input is doing. So it says the value of inches is one. So no data binding yet. We've just kind of written out some static info. 
Uh, we're going to start a code block here. And some of these things are tough to copy and paste out, so I may end up typing a little anyway. So we're going to set up a field. This is our default backing value. And it's going to be a double. So it's going to be a decimal type, you know, we're going to have a decimal format in here because um, those conversions can create some, some uh, uh, decimal numbers. And we've got our input of one, and we need to bind all these things together. So let's do that. Let's do this the most simple way possible. So we're going to take this inches value and just put it here, we'll say at inches. That's going to use our razor syntax to write that number out. And we'll also put it here at inches. And if we run the application, it doesn't really do much except for just write that value in those places that I just showed it. So we're going to do slash converter. And ah, I never gave it a page route. That's probably something I want to do. So we'll do when we see this route, we will display this page. Uh, I need to rebuild it. And live reload or something similar was supposed to be in this uh, version of Blazor, but it doesn't seem to work. At least that's what I've heard. I haven't really tried it. But I make sure I have the right samples too. I have two projects in here. I may be on the wrong one. Yep, I'm on server. I need to be on WebAssembly. Two projects, one solution. So that's where I got a little caught up. Um, converter again. There we go. So the value is one. And we're only binding one direction. So this is one, one direction binding. So I've got... Um, the value of 10 here and it's still displaying that the value of inches is one uh, that's because I've changed the value but there's nothing um, binding it back to the display there uh, let's see furlough is paid leave in the UK company can't maintain itself due to corona then the government will pay 80 percent of your wages that's a pretty nice uh, deal there yeah good luck to you folks in the UK you've got uh, a pretty good setup by the sounds of it there yeah we I'm not gonna get into the politics of it it's just too much uh, we will stick to the show content <laughs> Back to Blazor. Avoid the con the topic. All right. Um, all right. So we want to bind things, and we want to bind um, this data. Let's see what we're gonna do next here. We're gonna we're gonna add a, an event to handle this. So we could do this. We could say uh, update the value, and we're gonna do a little null or. Um, empty value or null check here uh, we don't we um, if the if we can't parse it then we're gonna say that uh, it's gonna default to zero so if some some crazy person comes in here and enters a text value um, it is not going to explode and create a uh, an exception now what we need to do is say that we want to bind to this so we're gonna say at uh, on click or is it on change? On change, then on change, we're going to update our value. Pretty sure that's how that goes. I need to be following along a little bit better. Yeah, on change, we're going to update that value. So this is just still one way uh, data binding, but we're capturing this event and we're manually telling inches to update its value. And now when we go back and rerun this again, and uh, I, I should put a, uh, a link in here for this so I don't have to keep doing the converter example here. Converter, and then if I tick it up, 
notice it is staying in sync. And um, the letter E, I think, is the only acceptable input here. So this is this is where things get tricky with like validation and stuff. So this is a little bit outside the book. You're going to get some some uh, editor editor notes here. So um, let's have some fun. Uh, I don't think I have any prizes I can give away besides a free ebook. Huh? All right, um, but just uh, for whoever's in the chat room that wants to answer, see if you can tell me this. It is a numeric input. So I have input value is, or sorry, input type is number. And that tells me that I can't type like A, B, C and stuff in that. Uh, so the ebook uh, I Am Ruck is about um, Blazor and getting started with Blazor is completely free. If you scroll down, scroll down, you'll see a big banner image. Click on that, it'll take you to the free ebook download. Um, so here's a question for the chat room. I, I wanna hear if anybody's got the answer for this one. Uh, this is a, a input type and I set the type to number and if I go back to the web page, and this is not a Blazor thing, by the way, this is a HTML thing. I can type all numbers in here. It looks like dashes are acceptable too, but it's gonna block every character, uh, alpha character, so A, B, C, but I can type E. So why does it accept E? And uh, I've put in code to double check in uh, so this doesn't throw an error, because you'd think making it a type number would be enough that you're always going to be able to parse it. And uh, Domin1995 got it first. That's right. And everybody else following up. And Ancient Coder says, I never noticed that. And neither did I until I uh, wrote this piece of code without the try parse. And then I started hammering away like, uh, what I want to pretend I'm the worst user ever and see what I can actually type in here. And the letter E is an acceptable input. It's not a valid number though. And um, yeah, so E to the exponent of whatever is a valid number, but E on its own is not. So uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting. I just it's one of those things that's kind of obvious once you see it, but then you don't really think about it when you're like, I'm just going to make it a type number, and then I don't have to check for all this nonsense because you can't enter anything but a number, but then you can. You can, and then, then your stuff's broke. And then you have bugs. And when you have bugs, that means you have ants. <laughs> Nobody wants Oh, is bugs. that what you want? Yep. Because that's how you get ants. Because that's how you get ants, folks. It is. Uh, use pattern zero through nine that in input mode numeric. Well, that's interesting. I never tried that one before. Yeah. So uh, some of the sound effects are new. So let me know if you can hear those, by the way, so I don't look like a crazy person. Uh, make sure you, um, you let me know if my sound effects are working. So I don't think I'm playing sound effects and making jokes about the sound effects and nobody hears the sound effects. All right, so we can count. And uh, the next thing the book says, well, that's nice, but should we have to handle all of that ourselves? Isn't there something easier that we can do? So what I can do is I can eliminate this code block and the dogs are going crazy. So that means either somebody's broke quarantine or something is being delivered. So we'll just let them bark for a minute. I have gatekeepers upstairs to take care of them. Uh, so if we do bind inches and we take the value out, this is the identical scenario that, um, oh, I, I pulled this up. Uh, thanks, Chicken Wing. Appreciate that. 
Uh, so we'll look at this in a moment. It's a little, uh, little off topic. Why gov.uk design system change input for numbers. So this is going to go on my to do like reading list, but uh, that's an interesting read there. Yeah, I get it. We'll accept all the cookies. So this tells you more about the, the number inputs in um, how to use pattern and input and why, why they added it and accessibility. And oh, this is a really cool read. I like this. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Appreciate it. Oh, I just realized I can resize. Oh, I can resize the remote desktop thing and get it on my way finally. Look at that. All right, cool. I like that. I'm going to put that in the background so I can look at it later. Matter of fact, I am going to, oh, no, I'll have to bookmark that on my other screen. I'm going to bookmark that for my podcast that I'm doing every other Monday. That's a good talking point. Cool. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, speaking of podcast, uh, we start doing that on Twitch as well. So make sure you follow the Code It Live channel. Code It Live channel. And then um, I'll pull up the uh, SoundCloud link as well. So uh, let's see. It is SoundCloud slash ESC dash podcast is the show. There's some really great ones on there. Um, feel free to browse through the backlog. Some of them are old, but some of them are um, very uh, uh, timeless. So there, there's a really great conversation with Julie Lerman on there. And we talk about how to just keep up in technology, which it has nothing to do with like framework of the week or any of that type of stuff. Um, it's a really good listen uh, if you want something to just chill out and listen to. Uh, but we're going to do those on Twitch on the Code It Live channel from now on. Uh, so everybody has like, uh, you know, something to watch uh, while they're in quarantine there. Um, so this bind uh, syntax will do two-way binding. And uh, now I have the same behavior without having to handle that update myself. So I like that. Whenever I have to write less code, I like that. Um, let's see what happens if I. Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't accept the e input there, nor does it accept it there. And notice it defaults back to zero. So I, it's doing that all by itself. Yeah, it doesn't take the scientific notation at all at that point. Um, so little tiny bit different, but not much. All right, what can we do next? So let's add another text box. And we will call that one. Um, it's going to be a number type again. Let's rearrange this a little bit. I don't think the order, well, let's match the order of the book. So let's rearrange it the other direction. Let's move the type declaration here. I think I did this just so it lines up better in the book uh, is when, when you look at the two statements here. And then uh, let's see. Let's take that out for now. It's not in the book. And then we'll add another backing field like this. So we have two default values. One is for inches, and this is the conversion to a centimeter from inches. So I have one inch and one inch converted to a centimeter, which is 2.54 centimeters. Yeah, I kind of said that wrong. One inch converted to 2.54 centimeters. Uh, so this is equal to that. All right, so let's load this again. And this is kind of the workflow of the book too. Um, so you get in kind of a shortcut version of it. Cliff notes. All right. So I can tick this up, but notice it has zero effect on this side. They are not bound together in any way, shape, or form. So how do we bind that one to that one so that they both behave together? So they're both kind of codependent on one another because that would make a nice conversion um, experience. 
So some good UX. So this is nice. This is a little like MVVM type of pattern, kind of small scale version of an MVVM pattern, model view, view model pattern. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're going to have a public property, which is a double value called inches with a capital I. And when we get the value, and this is a shortcut um, way to type kind of this format here. So we don't have curly braces and all that stuff. We're just gonna return inches. So if we looked at it in its current state, we'd be returning one. So if we called inches, we would get one back. And then um, we would set the value. So when we set the value, we wanna take the centimeters and convert the value by multiplying it by 2.54 and then set the inches value just calling inches equals value. So if, uh, if I were to set inches, it's just going, I'm gonna say, if I change inches from one to two, I'm just gonna change in the backing field to two, but I'm gonna change the centimeters backing field to two times 2.54. So that is gonna give me a conversion. And then I'll have to repeat that same thing for centimeters. So we'll paste in our centimeters code as well. So now I've got my inches backing field, my centimeters backing field, and two properties that correspond to the conversion of those values. And what I can do here, oh, and I noticed a little, um, little quirk here. Let's see, I'm consistent in the book, so that's good. Um, I don't need this at symbol up here, so that can go away. Uh, I, what I need to do though is instead of binding to the backing field, I actually want to bind to the property now because the property is going to then um, activate the get and set uh, uh, methods on the property. So now if I run it, let's go back to this. Uh, so when you see uh, the question uh, by Samu Mars, um, I'll get back to the running example here in a second. This is uh, a Lambda operator. And when it's used in this context, it would be called an expression bodied member. And this is basically the same as saying get, um, curly braces, uh, return inches with a lowercase i, like that. Uh, so that would have the same meaning. Let's see if that holds up. A little underscore should go away. There we go. Yeah, so those two things have the same meaning, uh, Samu. S Samu? Samu? All right, so same thing. Uh, and actually, let's see if we, oh, this is one of those scenarios where you don't get IntelliSense. If I was in a code behind file, it would actually tell me I can convert that. Oh, you're asking about the font. Ah, sorry, my bad, my bad. You said topography, uh, typography, um, my bad. So, fire code. Uh, actually, let's try this, bang, font, there you are. There's a link to it right there. I get that question a lot. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, let's see, Ancient Coder. Keep following my activities. It will be beneficial for you. As I only watch good streams. I will take that as a compliment considering you're here, Ancient Coder. So you only watch good streams and you're here. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, let's close this. Let's re rerun. If I rerun this, now that I've bound to the properties, I should be able to do a conversion. So now if I click up, there we go. Force four inches is equal to 10.16 centimeters. And in inverse, if I pull this down, then one 
centimeter equals 0.39 inches. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not fact checking that. I'm assuming that's correct. Um, maths, you know, let's see. It's easy. Uh, it's, it, this stuff makes it really easy. All right. Ancient coder codes in blazer though. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Am I missing part of the conversation? Code streams from ancient times. Um, so there's a, I'm going to go way off topic here. So talking about ancient coders. All right. Um, I don't know if this is still on Netflix. Uh, so it is, I think it's called the history of maths. Yes, it is. History of Maths is amazing. It looks like it's on YouTube. Um, I don't want to link directly to it because I don't know if these are legit links or not. Research this. Um, if you're a fan of computer science and nerdiness, check out the History of Maths. And it was on Netflix. It may not be on there anymore. Um, Regardless, it's worth like the $2.99 rental or whatever you can find it for. Um, it's an amazing series uh, and it tells you like the originations of um, uh, of different mathematics. And I know that sounds really like boring. It is not. The guy that does the uh, show is very entertaining and he puts it in a good format and there's lots of visuals and things. Um, really fun to watch. So check that out, ancient coders. Um, Stephen Wolfram does a podcast in the history of mathematics. Oh, that's cool. Very nice. Uh, so our conversion tool is working. We can make it better. So watch what happens here. So I'm going to type in um, another number, 10. And we know that 10 is not equal, 10 inches is not equal to one centimeter. And if I click, you'll notice that just jumped to 25.4. Now, the reason it did that, and I'll hit backspace and it won't change, uh, and that's not a good UX. It, the reason it's doing this is because it is binding on the on change event. And the on change event requires a blur to happen. So that's when we move out of the text box and click on something else. So when it loses focus, that is when the actual data binding happens. Um, this leads to pretty shabby user experience. So to fix this, uh, we're gonna do some advanced things here. So I'm gonna take the bind event and I'm gonna rewrite this so that it hooks to the out uh, on input event instead. So let's do that. So we'll come into here. Um, I'm going to create a new line just like the example shows. Keep things nice and clean and readable. And I'm going to say on event on input. And this is going to say instead of the on bind event, uh, bind on the on input event instead. And we can actually copy this code down and put the same code for our centimeters text box. So now it should change the value when we type. And notice it's doing it in real time now as I type in the keyboard. So that's a much better experience and that is binding on the on input uh, event. We can get a little more specific and we can say that we want to use the value property. Uh, we, can, we can specify that we want binding to occur on the value property because there's other properties maybe we want to bind to and do data binding on. 
Um, most of the time, it's going to be the value property, and that is the default property. But if we wanted to be specific, and maybe we had other things to bind to, we could also use this syntax. So both of these are valid. Both will do the same thing. Um, so we could bind a value like this. So this is saying bind the value of inches when the value or bind the value when on input occurs. Uh, this leaves us flexible for doing other properties. Bind dash. Um, I don't know what other properties we have. Maybe we wanted to set the type. Uh, I don't know if you could dynamically set the type, but you could do something like that. Um, don't know if a text box had text box has any other real valuable properties we would want to set but that was that's the general ideas this corresponds to the property name and when we want that property name to be bound what event do we want to tie it to cool all right why did the blazer team not leverage i notify property change for this don't know exactly i think um, so I think that they did it because they wanted to stay away from, um, opinionated framework technologies. So they didn't want, um, they didn't want it to be as opinionated as model view view model is in like WPF and, and, uh, uh, XAML and those things. So I think they did it for those reasons. That's kind of a concept from those those worlds. So I think that's why they did it, but I think only Steve Sanderson knows the answer to that question. Um, what is the difference between on input and on change? So uh, Dom, Domin 1995, the difference is on input happens when there is a, uh, keystroke. Uh, so when I press one or any other keystroke, that is going to trigger the event. Uh, where on change, I need to uh, change focus. So whenever the the input loses focus, that is when the event occurs. So that's the difference. Yep, there we go. And fuel is um, correct on that as well. Do select elements use the same binding on select? Um, I don't know if I went into selects uh, in this example. Um, I can do another example in a few minutes that has it. So let's finish this one up and commit this to GitHub before I move on to that. But that's a great question while we're on the subject. So let's do that. Um, let me bring up my Team Explorer and we'll say added. Oh, wait, hang on. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's not get this yet. Um, this actually isn't something covered in the book, but I need to go over to my nav menu. And I'm going to add a nav link to make this show up in navigation, just so if somebody downloads the examples, uh, they'll be easy to find. And we'll call this one converter. So there's our converter example. And we need an icon. Um, what would a good icon be for a converter? Arrow. Um, calculator. Boom. I like that. Let's use the calculator. So I just added a link on the side and a little calculator icon. That looks nice. Um, oh, and I'm missing some text, missing some text around the inputs. Let's make this look pretty. Um, do I have a visual in the book? So the value of inches. Um, yeah, don't have a visual in there. Ah, there it is. So this is what I'd like it to look like. So let's do that. 
let's add a label. Um, so this is going to be our inches. So the ID in here is just for the label field itself. And then this one will be, and I misspelled that, I know I did, centimeters. No, oh, okay, no I didn't. And put an ID on this one as well. Um, actually, let's put it at the end, try to keep these consistent. Just easier to read, I think. So they they all line up type, the bindings, and all that good stuff. All right. So now if we run it, we should get labels on either side of the converter. And then if we click, it moves. So the label four field moves the cursor into the, the box when we click on it. So there we go. Our converter is working. And uh, oh, we'll throw this in the middle too. Um, just to make things look a little prettier. Going a little bit outside the book, but I think it, it helps sell, sell the look and feel there. Can Razor use immutable models to drive UI? I don't know much about Razor. It could be a dumb question. That's not a bad question at all. Uh, so referring back to Elm, there is no out-of-the-box immutable um, uh, for Blazor. Uh, that is because there is no real out-of-the-box immutable for C Sharp. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. Um, I'm going to say this, though. Uh, in Elm, it is more than likely that Elm is built around the concepts of functional programming. Therefore, immutable and Elm probably go together like peanut butter and jelly. I know that's a very US thing probably, but you get the analogy, I hope. Uh, if you try to do these things in other languages, JavaScript, um, C Sharp, then you're kind of fighting an uphill battle. Uh, immutability is totally possible in C Sharp, but you're gonna irritate your team probably, and you're gonna fight the framework. So I'm just gonna give you a heads up. Um, the way you can do stuff like that, um, I could open up, um, I, I still remember the select question. We will get to that. Uh, so I'm not gonna get too far off here. Try .NET, maybe. Let's try try.net and see if I can show you an example. Yeah, this should work. So what you can do to create an immutable structure in uh, .NET is you can say, give me a public class of foo and then when you write your foo, whatever your class is, uh, come on. When I when I have my my object to make it immutable, you're gonna say, uh, give me a string. Now let's just do an int, int of uh, length. Um, trying to think how how to do this again. Uh, get yeah, we want to get the length, and then um, in your constructor you would have is going to be something like this anyway. Um, so I'm probably not setting this up right, but you would have a backing field, lowercase. Uh, there we go. And then we need the backing field is the problem. So it's not going to be straight up int. Uh, this would be so we'd set it up as a private read only. And then we'd need to set the length 
uh, on the initialization of the class. Uh, let's try to simplify this a little bit. You could use this and all that uh, type of stuff, but this is the general concept. Um, I'm getting some red underscores here because I don't know, I typed something in wrong, but uh, invalid. I'm not getting IntelliSense and stuff in here, so it's it's lighting it up pretty harshly. There we go. Nope, that wasn't it either. Um, I could probably do this in Visual Studio a lot better. So let's close that one out. We'll do. We'll open another project here. We'll tinker with it in a sec. Um, all right. Let's push this example, and then we'll go back to the two questions. Uh, right. So added um, binding example. I need to do that for server side and client side. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, let's do this. Let's open up another project. I'm terrible without IntelliSense, right? Like I, I fall apart when uh, when I start doing stuff without IntelliSense. Um, hmm. Do I have a project already that I can leverage for this? Don't think I have one on this this box. Let's see. Let's see what I was messing around with in this example. I was missing a, an int in the backing field. Okay. I knew I was doing something wrong. Uh, I don't know what this project was even about. We can play around in here. Um, oh, this was from last night's meetup. Let's not do that. I don't. I think I, I broke that project. New project. Oh, the this just came up. Look at this. Visual Studio Preview 2.1 is ready. Let's see what they fixed. That notification just came up as I was working here. I'm not going to hit install because it's God knows what it's going to break while I'm doing this. Release notes. In this new Git experience feature flag is enabled. There's a new Git tool. Message will appear guiding users to the new Git tool window. Oh wait, that's not even, that's the one I'm on. Released April 2nd, new. It's a great set of release notes there. Makes me really interested in downloading it. So it must be like a minor bug fix, but um, hopefully it fixes the uh, the component um, thing that's broken. Oh, maybe that is that is the one. Is it? That's got to be the release note for it. So something about the Git experience. Sure. I'll install that later. So I've committed changes. Let's not do that right now. Committed changes. Let's upload those changes. So we will do a git push. Did I hit it? Yeah, it's pushing, pushing up the GitHub. All right, cool. Now, Let's close this out and do file new project. Uh, Blazor app. Let's look at immutable structures and select boxes for a few minutes. Could be fun. Doesn't matter if it's server or client. We're just going to hack around in here and delete it when we're done. Um, so an immutable thingy in here. Let's let's add an immutable type. Let's do add a class. Uh, just a regular class, and we'll call it uh, um, not box. We'll call it rectangle.cs, right? So if we wanted this to be immutable, this is why I 
failed miserably. I can just type C C T O R constructor and get my rectangle. What I want to do if it's immutable is pass in um, pass in the values. So I want an integer of length and an integer of width. And I only want to be able to set those things uh, from the constructor. Yeah, um, if it's an internal front end project, sure, why not? Um, if I control period this, it will actually stub out a property for me. Create and initialize a length property. Let's see what we get there. And then if we do this one, we'll do that. And then this gives us our length and width. And then we can also tell it um, maybe overkill, but Yeah, I think it's overkill. It's uh, it's already a read-only property at that point. So we don't even need to specify anything else. We could set the backing fields to explicitly be private read-only properties. Uh, this should auto-prop them for us. Uh, so this would be an immutable type. We can't come in and set length and width after this point. Um, so, uh, so thanks, Chicken Wing. So that is actually my own creation, and I've shared it with the world. So if we go to Visual Studio Gallery, oh, all right, Visual Studio Marketplace. May have a bad certificate. There we go. All right, and it is going to be the mid-century theme. This is my theme. Uh, it's free. Feel free to download that and use it with your Visual Studio. Uh, so if React is working for you, there's no reason to rip out React, by the way. I would never tell somebody to take something working apart and replace it with something different. Um, all right, so if we want to do an immutable type, this would be it. Uh, now, the problem comes in with Blazor if you're trying to bind. So you wouldn't be able to do two-way binding if you did a immutable type. So length and width would not be bindable. You can only write those in an output. Maybe that's the ideal scenario. You don't want two way binding for some reason. So you would have like um, a flux pattern or something like that you throw at it. Uh, those things are all possible in Blazor. You just need to download NuGet packages and, and write some extra code to do it. glowing fonts so the comment is i like this theme but switch to the synthwave theme in visual studio code with the glowing fonts and i'll never switch back that's a little too much flair for me um the glowing glowing fonts like the i i don't think i need the 80s like coming back in my browser um but to each of their own enjoy that uh, so I, I like the idea of immutable types, but again, sometimes they get to be a little counterproductive in .NET. Um, so it just it's kind of a, do I have a good reason to use immutable types situation? Like, uh, is this validated? Um, they're also looking at with C Sharp 9. In C Sharp 9, you should be able to do something like this. I may have the syntax completely wrong, but it's going to be something like public record and then you would say um, length or int length int width and it would understand uh, how to do that. Uh, it, it would behind the scenes pretty much implement the same thing. So it would be actually be public record of rectangle and this is very pseudo coded, like I don't know the exact keywords they're using, but it's something similar to this. Um, and then you wouldn't have to write all of this code, it'd be the same exact meaning. So that's something that's possibly coming in C sharp 9. 
so let's switch back to the other topic. Somebody asked about switch statements, or not switch statements, select boxes. Um, so if I'm in my app, let's go to the index page, and I need a select select with options. What is the data binding here? Now you can bind the it's going to be at bind value, whatever your value is going to be. And um, when you bind the value, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're binding the, the options. So what you would have is at code equals, uh, it's always going to be a string type with this. And it's going to be something like this. You'd say selected equals some string. Um, and then you'd have a list of things. So you'd have your list of, of objects here. Um, I think I can write it like this. This should initialize it properly. And then of course, this is just working with a normal select box. There's also input select, which is like the form version of it. Oh man, dogs are going off again. Uh, let's see, what am I doing wrong here? Invalid expression. Okay, maybe I can't declare it like that. I thought I could. Let's look at our data weather forecast. Oh, I forgot the new keyword. New array. Ah, new array. That should do it. Yeah. Oh, uh, chicken wing had it. Thank you, chicken wing. And then we would be able to bind to selected but the list is not bound. We have to for each over that list like this. And the collection would then be things and the value would be item and the text would also be item. And that is how you would build a select list. Yeah, it looks like Kotlin has uh, some simple ways of defining records as well. Something's broken. I can feel it in the air. 404, WebAssembly, Blazor WebAssembly JS. Why would that be a 404? Okay, that was odd. Um, so there's our dropdown list and our data binding. Uh, if we want to prove out the data binding portion of it, we could say, uh, p um, selected equals selected. So it should write out the selected value so we can validate that it's actually doing something. Foo bar baz. And I can't remember who asked the question about data binding in a select, but hopefully that answered your question. I'm trying to scroll up through chat and see who that was. If, uh, if you're still here, let me know if that uh, answered what you needed to know. Forget which one of you fine folks it was. Uh, yeah, I can't find it. It was a while ago in chat. I promised I would get to it. Sorry it took so long. Silly porridge, if it was you, you're welcome. Um, that is that is the thing you need to do. Uh, we can also, do, you can also um, style those with um, the uh, bootstrap theme. And then of course, if you want to go really pro, shameless plug, sorry, I got to do it, but I love our stuff. Uh, the Teller QI for Blazor, if you really want to do some fancy data binding, um, the drop down list that we have uh, does all the things 
looks amazing as well. Has nice animations, whole nine yards. Look at all that fine business it's doing. And um, what's really cool is it does templates too. So you can do that. And you have header templates and footer templates. And uh, when you select the item, it has a, uh, notice the price is not shown in the selected item. So you can define all those things custom as well. And they work with validation. So choose an employee and they're keyboard navigable. So how cool is that? Um, so that's the stuff that we work on at Progress. Uh, Telerik UI for Blazor, 30 day free trial, check it out. We got lots of nice demos as well and theme builder. So you can just go in and start theming like with the material theme and do all the things with the material theme. Got some nice help here. That's all cool. Uh, it's a jumbled mess. I think there's a little bit of a lag there. All right. You can easily just come in and say, I would like a dark theme and it will just generate a dark theme that you can download. And boom, look at that. Now we're dealing with a dark theme. How cool. I love this stuff. I, I use this stuff all the time. All right. Let's get back to the ebook. I have more samples I need to code away at. Had you at keyboard navigable. <laughs> nice. Um, all of our stuff is WCAG compliant. If I'm saying that right, WCAG compliant. Um, and uh, accessible, screen reader friendly, all that good stuff. CAG clients. Um, topic for another show. All right. Uh, let's see. So I did the code behind approach. I did the data binding. Um, Blazor render tree explained. I should probably put this in the code as well. This is going to be a little bit of a deep dive, I think. Uh, but let's do this. Um, I've got another hour. I'm hanging out for another hour. Uh, so if you're if you're with me, I'm in. Um, the the Blazor framework works on a DOM abstraction. And if we want to talk about DOM abstractions, it's done really well in the book. I suggest you read the book. Um, this is going to be a very shortcut version of what's in the book. Basically, when you write a DOM element or a, an HTML page, like in the example, this beautiful example that the author put together, me, what can I say? Uh, let's see here. This is the coolest thing I have ever seen. This is possibly the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, when you write it, write up HTML, it gets turned into a DOM uh, tree like this. So you have your doc type, HTML, all these things kind of correspond to this up here. Let's do let's do the old zoom in and zoom in enhance, right? Um, so doc type correlates to this, uh, this body element ends up here and it builds out this tree structure. This is a Dom. All right. So this is your Dom. This is what it looks like. And blazer helps with the Dom because it's not like jQuery where we're going in and we're going to say, I want to change the hello world text to something else. So I'm going to write a jQuery selector and I'm going to go find this H1 element by ID. And then I'm going to take the text element and then I'm going to hack that. And I'm going to change it to say some other, uh, some other words, words. Yeah, whatever. Uh, so it's, it's going to do that. And uh, what Blazor does instead, this is kind of the jQuery example. Uh, you would you would repaint the entire screen basically using jQuery. Uh, it's a very bad thing to do. It's not very uh, optimized. Um, so yeah, this is all Curious Drive. This is all in the book, my friend. Um, Blazor has a DOM um, 
shadow dom render tree is what it's called in blazer and it keeps up with all these changes so in blazer instead of it repainting the entire screen what it's going to do is it's going to look at this copy of the dom so it's going to make a object graph out of your components and it's going to say all right we've removed these elements we added these elements we updated two of the three elements these didn't change we don't need to change those we'll keep them the same we'll do a diff and compare the only things that changed in this context and we'll only update the two boxes that needed to be updated so in this long example here i'm paraphrasing this is a very long chapter um, you go through all these iterations and on the fifth one it goes just blue and green got swapped so we're only going to go into the dom and change the blue and green elements we'll leave orange alone orange didn't do anything wrong orange gets to stay the same and uh then then that is the only update that takes place in the dom it saves like six repaints how do you know all this this is not in the microsoft docs i believe I don't know if this is in the docs. Uh, so this took um, some extra reading. There's notes out there from Steve Sanderson, um, who is the one that created the framework. Um, so I've read some of the stuff that he puts on his blog. And uh, I've also talked to him in person and been in his workshop. Um, and uh, we've we've spoke about how this works before. Uh, so I've gotten a lot of information from from the team directly on that. Um, so that's how the, the render tree works and you can see the render tree in a couple different places. So if we look at component base, uh, the, uh, component base has a render tree builder. You can also inspect the HTTP traffic. Yeah, it's kind of, you can kind of gr grasp what's happening from traffic as well. Um, We'll show, let's see, we'll, we'll do some, we'll do some fun stuff here in a second. So this is all stuff you can follow in the book later. I think you'll find this very interesting. So render tree builder is part of our component structure. Every component you make has a render tree. And what happens is when you build your application, you build your component, it compiles your razor into um, a component class and I will show you that uh, we're gonna take if we look at our counter component uh, thank you for the follow Matt Matt Sund Matt Sund Matt Sund I don't know if there's a space there um, I'll just say thanks Matt all right oh another follower sorry for the interruption folks we have followers Terry and Terry Andrew Davis. I think I got that right. I'm getting better at names or you guys are getting better at making names. One of the two. I'll accept either. Um, so let me see where I was. Uh, all right. Component base is... Um, you guys can't see this very well. Let me zoom in a little more. Uh, this is basically what your component gets turned into. So... If we have a counter component with a route, uh, it gets turned into a counter component with a route attribute that inherits from component base. And this is what the counter code looks like. And another follower, uh, Detour or Detour. Uh, thank you very much for following. Appreciate that. Uh, this, is what your, this is what your render tree actually looks like. So if you look here, we've got H1 is my counter. I have a paragraph. Inside that paragraph is the words current count. It's binding to this current count. Then we close that H1 tag. Uh, then there's a markup element that's just providing some space uh, or a, a carriage return. Then we open up a button tag that has a class from the Bootstrap family and it has an attribute that is a mouse argument of on click. So there's a click event here. And that's going to bind to the counter.increment count action. So that gets us to our increment count here. Then it has a text called click me. And then we close that element. So hopefully that made sense. If it didn't, let's take a look at our project. And I will show you side by side 
what that looks like in the browser. So go to counter. Uh, there's my count, counter component. Let's see if I can do this. Um, and then let me, oop, I, I need another tab. There we go. Tab up on that side, counter on that side. And we should be able to correlate these things together. Um, this needs to be zoomed in a bit, little bit, I think. All right. So if you see this counter text, this is what it looks like in the DOMs or the virtual DOM. It has a render tree builder of add markup content. Uh, there's our counter um, on the left hand side, the H1 tag. Uh, this is my paragraph tag. This is my instance of a reference of this dot current count. And then our button is here. And the on click event is defined here, which points to this um, method handler here. So when I click, it then sees that there is a change in the DOM. And it's not going to update this. It's not going to update this. It's not going to update that. It's only going to see a difference here, which is this line here. So the DOM, uh, the virtual DOM is smart enough to go, all right, the only thing that changed was this. Go find that HTML uh, node and just update that to the number three, four, five, and six, all right? That's all talked about in detail in that chapter, but what does this mean to us as component developers? I'm either getting a lot of deliveries today or there's people taking walks or there are people breaking the um, people breaking the uh, quarantine. Not good. If I find door-to-door -door salespeople again today, I'm going to be upset. There's a time and a place, folks. This is neither of them. Uh, right. So let's add a page and let's call it render tree uh, example. This, oh, hopefully this screen is what gets patched in that update that I haven't installed yet. All right, so this is our render tree example that's in the book. Um, it doesn't tell you to build it, but it does show um, an example like this. Uh, color, I don't have a color object. Hopefully there's one outlined. Um, oh, there isn't, but it is such a simple class. I can kind of get an idea of what that would look like. So color would be something like the public class color uh, is going to be an integer of ID and a string of value. Whoops, public string value. So it's just a simple data structure to show uh, what this looks like. A uh, new item, colors, new color. Um, Did I goof on my example? That should be a color, shouldn't it? Oh, well, I think I found a typo in the book. So I will make sure I update the book. If you see this, you know what I'm talking about now. All right, so I've got my colors. Um, when you write methods, how do you know if you should call base dot build render tree builder. Um, if you're going to override the render tree builder, um, I think what you're asking there is uh, if, if there's something, if you're going with 100% uh, your own render tree builder, you would not call it. If you want to pass in something that render tree builder already has, then you would pass it to the base builder. 
I've, have I ever tried to connect a Blazor hub from an area like admin or something like that? I have not. Um, I don't know if there's a way uh, I would, if I find an article, I'll try to try to mention it somewhere later, tweet it out or whatever, but I haven't seen anything myself. I haven't researched the topic either though. Uh, so uh, I think I, I converted this in the book to uh, from an item to a color to make it a little more concise and created a typo. So I need to make note of that. Uh, but we have our colors. We're gonna put them in a list and then reverse the list. So let's see what happens. Uh, we need to be able to route to this. Let's route to it. Page equals, or no, we don't need equals. Page is going to be um, render tree example. We'll run that. And I can zoom out. This is a little, a little loud. It's a little loud. All right. Render tree example. And now we have a list with checkboxes. And this is where things get tricky with the render tree. So let's look. I'm going to do an inspect. And I think this is what uh, somebody mentioned earlier, is we can actually see this happen in the DOM. Um, let's take a look here. Let's move this to a sidebar so we can view it side by side. Yeah, right like that. And let's reverse this list. I'm gonna click that button. And uh, I should have had these expanded. I should be able to click it again. There we go. You can see the render tree in action here. And you can see what it's updating. So the render tree is very helpful and very efficient here because you can see it's updating the H1 tag and only the H1 tag. Now, what is important about this example is it is not physically reversing all of these list items. So see how I have this list item um, hovered here and it has that green box? I'm not updating that list item. I'm only updating the H1. So this creates an actual problem for me. So this is why it is important to know uh, which, or, or important to know what the render tree is up to when we're building our components. Because I'm doing this, but watch this. I'm gonna check purple. I checked purple. I'm gonna reverse this list. And the checkbox floats. So green is correlating with the checkbox. Now it's purple. Um, that could be an issue. That could create a bug, and we don't want bugs. Oh, is that what you want? Yup. Because that's how you get ants. Yay! That's how you get ants, guys. You don't want bugs. They're bad news. It's it's all bad. I'm gonna go ask directions to our next huge embarrassing failure. You're a huge embarrassing failure. So, how do we fix it? There is an easy way to fix that. It's, it's outlined once again in the book. So if we scroll down, and I, I really need to remember to fix that typo. That's gonna bother me. So it's showing this scenario here. And we can actually hint to the render tree and tell it to um, keep these things together. And we do that through the at key keyword. So what we're going to do is come in to the list item. Listening to air dolls. I don't know if I, I don't get the reference there. Sorry. All right. So key equals. Um, and this is going to be item dot ID. So now we're going to key off of this ID number. It's 
important to have a unique identifier. It doesn't necessarily have to be an, an integer, but it has to be unique. Uh, we could also use value because there's only red, blue, green, purple, orange. Uh, there's no duplicate values there, but that being a string means there's a chance. So there's an integer here that I can key off of. I'm gonna go ahead and key off of that. We're gonna refresh this. Let's look at that example again. So this is the initial example. Remember, the checkbox floats. It doesn't follow the item list. We'll go to that same example here. I'll check the top box again, hit reverse, and now the box moves with the color I checked. So that's a very important thing to learn about Blazor and the render tree. So if we look at it side by side, and now I hit reverse here, notice the list item, and actually the whole unordered list changes. It's a little less efficient, but it takes care of our bug. And we were able to do it just by, just by adding the key. And that's some pretty easy stuff. This is like taking candy from a candy-hating baby. Right? Really easy stuff. Oh, okay. Sorry, I missed that reference. Thanks for the update, though. That's good stuff. All right. So as easy as taking candy from a candy-eating candy-hating baby. That's how easy that is. Just put key in there. If you ever run into that issue, you know where to find the solution. Um, let's see. This needs to go uh, in here. Let's put a comment in here. No baby hates candy, though. That may be true. We'll put in a comment here uh, for people to just in case they're not following closely in the book. They have a little hint as how this is supposed to work. Um, so we'll toggle that key off and they can see that it doesn't follow. All right, now let's add a menu item for that and we'll publish that on GitHub. So I need to go back into my nav menu and we will copy our nav menu item and we will call this one render tree example. And we can push that up to GitHub so people can check it out. And we need an icon. Um, what would a good icon for this one be? A list of some kind? A list would be fine for me. Blazer Power Glove. Got to get the Blazer power, power Glove up. We haven't seen it in a while, right? So, whoops, wrong meme. That's not the Power Glove. Obviously, it's the wrong one. That's the one I wanted. Got to get the Power Glove out. That was some pretty powerful stuff, the render tree. So now we have a render tree example uh, loaded in the, um, the thing here. So let's let's add one more message to that. Uh, render tree example. So we want we want people to go in there and toggle that key attribute. Right, that should be good. Uh, let's 
go to GitHub and push that change. So we have our render tree example on GitHub now. And again, I have to repeat all of these for server side, even though they're the same. They will not be any different, but I wanna make sure people have them in both server and client side so they can see how identical they are. That wraps up that chapter. And then we get to JavaScript interoperability. Uh, I think this might be a topic for another show. Um, first of all, I don't have an example exactly on how to do this um, without installing all of the Telerik UI for Blazor and all of the dark and light themes. That's going to take a while for me to build. Um, I have it in another repo. I can copy it over, but I'd like to actually go through it. And then I get into geolocation and that's that's kind of an advanced one. I think I'll save that for another show. That's got some some extra steps. So that's a that's a long chapter as well. Uh, things got a little more difficult near the end, so we kept getting more and more difficult as we progressed through these things. I could probably do the Razor Class Library chapter though. Let's take a look at that one. We'll do the others later, I promise. We'll do them tomorrow. Um, this one is pretty easy, and I think I can get away with only doing it in one place. So we'll add a Razor class library to this pro project. Mr. Chris DeMars, welcome. Welcome, buddy. Nice to see you again. Let's, uh, let's, give, uh, let's give Chris some fireworks. Welcome. Welcome, Chris. We're just uh, we're just blowing stuff up here today, man. It's been a lot of fun. We've gotten good um, good feedback. It's uh, it's been a fun day. Just doing some work, getting some examples written up for my ebook, and publishing those online. Uh, people have been asking a lot for them. I should have had them up already, but uh, I knew it'd make good show content. Is that a bad thing to say? It's not a bad thing to say. I want to do it live. I wish I had the do it live meme. I don't have that. Um, I can say this is pretty hot stuff, though. Isn't it pretty hot stuff? All right. Let's uh, let's do let's do the um, Razor class library. So hot. That's my yeah. I I love that one. That is so eighties. Like, it's so 80s, man. Whoops. That's not the one. That's the one. It's hot stuff. It is 80s hot in here. All right. We want a Razor class library. We're going to do add new project. Nope. New, new, new item. Nope. New project. Yeah. Add new project. Uh, Razor class library. So... I need another template here. Razor class library template. And that is right here in my uh, list of items. I've got my Razor class library. And then we can add that. Razor class library one. Let's see if I named it in the book. I will keep that naming convention. Razor class library. Razor class library one. I was lazy. I kept it the same. Let's do it again. Razor class library. We're not going to check this box. That is not something that we want to do. We'll hit create and we will get this nice example here. And it has everything that I mentioned in the book. So if we zoom in, let's zoom and enhance. We've got our WW root, which is our JavaScript, our PNG file and our CSS class. And then also we have a imports file and we have a component and we have a JavaScript interop file. So let's play around with those and see what we can do with a Razor class library. So these are super handy for making libraries that we can share on the interwebs on nougat.org or GitHub. And 
they give us a um, nice way to, to share these things and we can add those to our projects really easy through either a NuGet package or a reference. So let's add a reference. So we have um, Razor class library one here and we need to make a reference to it in our application that's going to consume it here. So to do that, we'll just right click on dependencies and say, add a project reference. And you can see in the UI, I have Razor class library one. I'm gonna click okay. And if you're one of those folks that does not like uh, Visual Studio for some reason, you just do it here. You say item group, project reference, and then you type in the path. Just that simple, that's all it's really doing. So now we have a reference to this library and we want to go into our view imports file. And we want to say at using razor class library one, and that's going to give us access to the component everywhere. And then we can come into our pages and let's see, do we have anything on our index? We do not have anything on our index yet. We can put it there. Uh, so we're going to reference a component so there's a component called component1.razor inside of that razor class library down here on the right. Um, I think the chat room's over the top of it, so let's zoom in a little bit. I want this component in this project up here. To do that, all I have to do is call it out by name now. Um, uh, do I want to put it in here or not? Let's not put it in the index. Let's create a page for it. Let's create a page, add new component. We'll call this class library. So we're gonna consume the, the razor class library on this page. All I have to do is say component one, and that component comes out of that library and into my project. That's it. Let's run it. You'll notice it works, but only partially. So uh, let's see, we got a route to that. Uh, I'd never set a route to it. I keep doing that. I keep doing that over and over again, but that's okay. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. They ask you how you All right. So let's do this again. Let's try this one more time. I'm just going to call it class lib. Class lib. So we're going to consume Razor class library here. Uh, Chris is out. Thanks, Chris, for stopping in, buddy. All right. So we're going to consume this. Uh, now we can route to it. Uh, we get a new follower. Thanks for what letters? Like that name. That's clever. What letters? Uh, class lib. Is that it? Yeah. So we're consuming our class Razor class library from inside of our project. There's a little issue though. It actually shouldn't look like this. We're missing some resources. There should be a background around that thing and it should have like a striped pattern on it. And we're missing that. And if I go into my DOM and inspect, uh, we're not showing an error. I thought we'd show an error for that. So that's, uh, I guess the error is happening in CSS. That's why we're not seeing it. But what we need to do is we need to come into our index page and we need to make a reference to the style sheet that is in that Razor class library. So, uh, throwing some blazer gloves in the air. Thanks, Janescu. Um, we need to create a link to the content that is in that class library. So what we're gonna do is say, uh, it's gonna be underscore content slash razor class library one slash um, styles 
dot CSS. And that should give it to us. If I did that right, we should then see this light up correctly. So let's go back and refresh this page and um, class library. And that didn't do it, so I got the path wrong. So something's wrong with the path there. Let's see what the console says. I'm still not seeing anything blow up. Let's double check, do a reload cache. Yeah, still missing something there. Um, blazer gloves are expensive. I need to check that out for myself. I'd love to have one to, to hack away at. And it may be like sacrilegious to, uh, to cut one up, but I really want to do that sometime and make something fun out of it for the show. Oh, I forgot the rel style sheet property, and maybe that was where I fell short. But thankfully, there was a nice book to help me figure out what that error was. Um, let's try this again. I don't think I need to recompile for that. Oh, maybe I do. Maybe I do. Or maybe this is feature is broken. Let's see, blazer wasm, uh, blazer wasm, content, class library one, style CSS. Uh, let's try control F5 again and go to the route, class lib. And I'm still seeing an error. Why am I still seeing an error? Oh, now I'm actually getting one in the console like I was supposed to. Fail to load resource. So it's not able to find my CSS file. Why is it not able to find my CSS file? And that's a good question. Why can't it find my CSS file? It should be Razor Class Library 1 dot styles CSS. Huh. That is interesting. I don't think there's been a change. do not think there's a change in this version as to how this operates. This should be correct. Content Razor Class Library 1 styles.css rel style sheet. Hmm. Not seeing the problem. Let's try a rebuild. Maybe that has something to do with it. Let's try a rebuild. Let's go ahead and run this in yeah, something's something's wrong, and it's not my code, I can tell you that. I'm pretty certain of it. There it goes. So the rebuild did it. So it 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 wasn't um, outputting the files to the right folder or something. Uh, rebuild took care of it. So now it's pulling the resources from uh, so this this content link is pulling from the Razor Class Library's root folder. So that's what that's aiming for right there. So if we zoom and enhance here, this um, style sheet here is the one that is referenced there. And we are referencing it from this application in the index HTML. And then uh, the background image is coming from that style sheet and this resource here. So those things are all connected together now. And we can ship those libraries over the interwebs. So that gets us our Razor class library. Then what's really nice is we can use um, the JavaScript interop that's included as well. And I know I skipped the section on JavaScript interop, but uh, we can still check it out here and talk about it. So the first thing I need is if I'm going to use some interop, and interop is just basically calling the example JavaScript code. So there's a little JavaScript snippet in here that says window example JavaScript functions show prompt. We're going to pass JavaScript a message and have it put a dialog on the screen. 
first things first, let's go back here and we need to put the script in here. We'll put a script in and we'll say that the source of this script is underscore content slash razor class library one slash example inter or js interop js and that should give us access to the javascript we need the next thing i need to do is i need to tell my component that we're going to be using the ijs runtime instance we'll call it js now we need to do something with it so i'm going to copy this piece of code here um actually let's let's put this in we need a h1 tag called hello message and we will set up a little bit of code here to interact with that message box. And we don't need two code blocks. Let's remove some of that. Now, we've got message bound here. So it should say hello world. We've got a task of show prompt, which we haven't called yet. When we call it, we're gonna set the message from it. And we're gonna say, give me the example JS interrupt, which is coming from this C sharp file now. And we're gonna call the prompt method, which will then invoke the JavaScript method, passing in this value that we send it and saying, hello world. Now, it's going to prompt us with a native dialog box from the browser. Whatever we type in that box will then get sent back to message bound here and displayed in our hello message box. That's how it should work. Um, so let's do that. We need a button called show prompt to wire that up. So now we can invoke the task of show prompt and kick off this process. So now if we go into our class libs example and I click show prompt there is a C sharp button an HTML button with C sharp code that opened up a dialog box in the native browser dialog and we can type whatever we want here I'm gonna put in blazor just like the ebook says I'm gonna click OK and there is the text hello blazor and that's that. Why do we need JS interop to do this? Why isn't this built into Blazor? What determines what's native or what we need interop for? That is an excellent question. So let's boil that question down again. Uh, why is the native prompt not covered by a Blazor API, and why do we have to do this with a JavaScript interop, and what decides when something is a Blazor thing and when it is an interop thing? Um, this is very much a .NET team uh, issue. So I would assume at some point you have to draw a line and say, here's the things we're gonna support natively, um, here's what's possible in this release time frame, and we need to focus on key features that people will use. And we will write uh, wrappers around the things that we think people need out of the box. And then there's the rest of the DOM. There are so many DOM APIs that you probably just don't recognize that this is a massive monumental task. And if we go to Mozilla, they have really good documentation. Um, Let's see, what is the site I'm looking for? If I just do geolocation API, we can find all of the docs. So, 
is the top level of uh, web APIs. These are all of the web APIs. There's a lot. Uh, so this is many, many things. Uh, ambient light events. I don't even know what the heck that means. Battery, uh, battery API, background tasks, fetch API, file system API. I think fetch API we've got covered with HTTP client. That probably is um, what it is using underneath. So there are some built in, some are not. Index DB. I mean, there's a ton of things. Resize observer, observer API. Uh, there is um, geolocation, all those things. Some of these things are included inside of Blazor. Obviously, we have DOM uh, manipulation functionality. Uh, and that's abstracted into the render tree. There is the um, fetch API, which is doing HTTP calls and getting stuff from web endpoints for us through HTTP context. Uh, so there's very important things that have been covered already, but you can see the pretty wide surface of stuff that people are gonna wanna ask for. Um, and there's some very low level things still that we don't have. Um, and like one of them is just setting focus on a text box requires JavaScript interop. And that is not built in out of the box. So it was, I think, a matter of finding what is um, important and just tackling those things first. And I think we'll see other API surfaces come in the future. So we've got the, the um, JavaScript interop covered through that example. We can go much more deeper into JavaScript interop on Friday. Uh, we'll do the geolocation example. I have some te uh, Telerik specific examples in there. Um, we'll try to get into those if we have time, but they're pretty lengthy. Um, they involve being able to swap hot swap themes so you can do um, a theme swap from light to dark, which is really cool, but it takes quite a bit of setup uh, to do that. So basically you get a banner, you can click light and dark mode, and you can toggle, we'll scroll all the way down to the end of the chapter, you can toggle between these two uh, light and dark themes. Um, the themes require Telerik UI for Blazor. We'll probably do that in another project outside of the one that we're working in now and link those together um, so if people don't want to have a 30-day free trial they don't have to do that just for the ebook but it is a nice set of examples um, we just need to add a nav menu and i'll push this one up to the web where everybody can find it and uh, i lost track where i am nav menu we'll put another nav menu on here and we'll call it the class or library example. Razor class library example. And then I need an icon. What is a good icon for a class library example? A puzzle piece is perfect. All right. So all I did there, in case you're following along and kind of lost track of what I was doing, I just added another menu item called Razor Class Library Example. That's where our little puzzle piece comes in, and there's where our new example lives. So that covers a lot of stuff. Uh, this repo contains files from the free Blazor ebook. Let's check that link. That's good to go in case people find that and don't have it. Uh, counter example is going to stay. Uh, fetch data is going to stay because it has the code behind example. We have our weekly weather forecast with our select enabled component. People are really interested in this one. Um, we have our converter, so we can do our data binding. And we have our render tree example with our reversible list and our razor class library example. So there's, there's some things that we built. So hopefully that was good information for everybody. Um, we will do this again tomorrow at, at noon Eastern Standard Time. How does that sound? Uh, let's get this pushed up to GitHub.
team explorer uh, added CL example. And then I will go back off the air and update all of these examples to include the server side because it's going to be a lot of copy paste from this example here. Uh, so there'll be two um, pretty much identical rep or pretty much identical projects in the repo uh, with uh, server side and client side Blazor examples from the ebook. So you can see how those compare to each other. All the same, pretty much for the most part, going to be identical examples. But you don't want to see me copy and paste stuff, so I will do that on my own time off the air. Uh, I've got about 15 minutes here before I really need to wrap up and go, uh, so I'm happy to take questions. Um, Janescu's got one already. On .NET 5, there will be less JS and more C Sharp. That is correct. I don't know what the team has committed to, so I don't want to say anything that they haven't said in public. But yes, they are investigating more um, JavaScript interop capabilities that will be built in by default. Um, if I were a betting person, my assumption would be file upload is coming. And it would handle just reading files off of disk and then supplying you with a data stream. Um, if you want more advanced stuff and you don't want to wait for .NET 5 to roll around, we've got plenty of things in here already that can help you out. Uh, we've got our own upload component in here. So people were asking for this quite a bit. Uh, so you can select a file right off a of disk. We'll grab a NuGet package. Why not? We can open that. And look, it says uh, it's doing validation here. Only PDF or docs are allowed. Let's go find my ebook. We'll upload that. Uh, Blazor ebook. Oops. Oh, this is a different machine. I can't do it from here. There it is. There it is. Maybe I do have it. So we can upload that. We get a nice status indicator, and our book is uploaded. And we just need to give it a name and an email and all that. We could submit. So. Those things are built in the Teller QI for Blazor, which is really cool. Um, we, we have a lot of really nice stuff in there already. Uh, Curious Drive, can you please talk about how PWA functionality is wired in Blazor WebAssembly? How does it work? All right, let's see what I can tell you. Um, I, I want to say that there was a better resource than myself. Um, I, I'll try to do my best, but I think if you go to .NET uh, ASP.NET Community Standup, they actually demoed this, I think, last week. Or this week, was it? So check that out if you haven't watched it already of Curious Drive. I think they talk about it in here. Um, is this the right episode? This is not the right episode. I linked you to the wrong episode. I'm sorry. This is the right episode. You watched it. All right. So maybe they didn't cover it there. I saw these guys talk about it at the MVP Summit, and um, I thought they had covered it there. Let's do this. We'll do File, New, Project. Uh, you can do Blazor app now. So we can do a new Blazor app. Uh, So we'll create a PWA app, and then if you go to WebAssembly, and then you zoom in on this here, look at that. We have a checkbox. We have a checkbox, and James Quick is rating with a party of nine. James Quick, if, uh, if I'm getting the, the right person with the name, um, James, we met ages ago, ages ago, when um, I was in, I want to say, Boston for a code camp, possibly a code camp. And this was when I first started working with Progress. So this is like five years ago. And I think at the time, I don't know if you're still working there, I think at the time you were working for Microsoft if I have the right James Quick. 
So it's been forever um, since we bumped into each other. But yeah, you remember, cool. So yeah, we talked to we talked at the Boston Code Camp ages and ages ago, um, and uh, just moved to New York. No longer at Microsoft, but uh, that's you. Cool. Nice to see you again. It's a small world, my friend. Uh, so we were talking about the uh, Blazor and progressive web apps. So in the last two releases, I think it was, uh, we actually got, um, oh, you're doing DevRel at OAuth now. Cool. Very cool. I think I know some people there. I'm trying to remember who works there. I, I know a lot of folks in DevRel. I'm trying to place which ones are at OAuth. Or Auth0, I'm sorry, not Auth0. Auth0. Um, I know I've met somebody from there, though. Uh, when do when we do binding on select elements, when the value changes, HTML element actually is affected by the option element or the child. So it's going to be not at the option. It's going to be at the select level, I think, chicken wing. All right, take care, James. Is uh, again nice to bump into you uh, after all these years, man. Uh, take care. Um, so yeah, chicken wing. That it should be the value is set at the select element level. Um, you can tell the option to set a value by default, I believe, but that will then change after you change the select, like you select something else. So you can set the default value there. Um, progressive web app. Uh, we can select that box and hit create. Don't know how well documented this process is yet. Um, my bot is not that smart. I don't have a ton of commands yet. Um, but I do have, uh, you can say bang GitHub. And you can get a list, uh, or you can get to my GitHub page font for uh, the font that I use and I would have to look at my bot to find out any of the other stuff because I really don't use my bot enough unfortunately that's not how a select works maybe I'm wrong mm, I think that is I could be wrong maybe that's not how a select works um, uh, let's see so we do have a PWA now and I'm trying to remember where this stuff is. Here we go. When publishing a uh, when publishing swap service worker publish JS in place of service worker .js. So there's like a super annoying cache problem with um, with uh, PWAs, and this is a resolution for that. So you will have a hell of a time. Uh, iterating your app in development mode if you have the published.js version uh, enabled. So you want to swap those uh, when you publish it. Um, this is very early on. The, some of this stuff may change, like may get more tooling around it and whatnot. Um, and I don't know how well it's documented, but I haven't checked uh, docs .teller, or docs.microsoft.com and seen what's up there. Uh, so I know it comes with a manifest.json file and it comes with the icons required and it should also have, um, so there's our manifest.json, there's our icons. Uh, I don't see, oh, there's service worker registration. So it's registering the service worker, which also should have the offline mode capabilities built in. And I don't know if that's something we would edit or not. Let's see what's in service worker. In development. Yeah, so that's our dev mode. This is where I said it creates a nightmare if you don't, if you use the published version locally uh, because it will cache all of these resources 
and it is hard to get that cache invalidated after you make changes. So that will that will enable the PWA though when, when you do publish it. And then I think there's a way to set up in, an install screen and stuff through this as well. Uh, I don't know where to find it all, but let's control F5 here and see what we get. So this is a PWA version of the normal Hello World app. And what we can do is say inspect. And like I said, there, there's a way to add an install screen. There's a little JavaScript that you have to add to do that. Um, the, uh, is GitHub down? Is it down? I've been publishing stuff to GitHub all day. Looks like GitHub went offline. You're right, uh, Unlimited Bytes. Look at that, it's just swirling like crazy there. Um, there's a, a NuGet package that you, you can use alternative to this, and it does some other stuff for us, um, like creates that install dialog, but you can force it. You can force it by going to, I'm trying to remember where this is found, application, and it knows that this is a PWA. It's identified it as a PWA. And then I believe they moved it. And when I say they, I mean Chrome. Um, there should be a thing that forces it to show an install button. Ah, there it is. They, there, that's it right there. So there's our install. Look at that. So it is set up for an install it doesn't initialize this dialog without you physically going up to the plus button and clicking and then you can click install let's do that now our app is running as a pwa and it has no web browser attached to the outside so there's no address bar and um, we can expand it full screen and it has an app icon and it has a preview hover and we got all that stuff for free. Um, if we want to uninstall, we also click on this uh, kebab icon up here, and then we hit uninstall and remove it, and then it goes bye-bye. So, yeah, so GitHub is, uh, GitHub is down. They ask you how you are, you don't just have to say that you're fine, when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. They ask you. GitHub is down, folks. So all the examples I published today, you're going to have to wait to get those until GitHub comes back online. Yep. So, you know, it's it's been it's been one of those type of weeks. It really has. It's uh weeks, years, 2020. This is 2020 in a nutshell. So, all right. Let's see here. Uh, so we, we have our PWA out of a box, out of the box. I hope that answers your question. Uh, so it's just a matter of checking a box in the file new project dialog. It adds the assets for us that we need. Um, there is some more advanced things that you can do, but I'm not a PWA expert. I can't remember how to do those things off the top of my head, but you can make like install dialogs and things that make everything uh, look nice. Can't get my app to get that installation button. So if you're if you're trying to do, did you do it from um, the template or are you trying to add PWA functionality to an app? I don't care if it's a Blazor app or not. You're, are you trying to add PWA functionality from scratch yourself? If you are, and I'm, I'm a betting person, I'm going to say, yes, you are trying to add it yourself. There are three, I think, three key things that you need. So listen up. You need, first of all, a manifest file. Second of all, you need icons. Uh, and then, so yeah, you're going to need, um, you need manifest.json, you're going to need icons, and then you need the offline, uh, or you need a service worker registered. 
you get those three things, you should be good to go. Um, another thing I think is required is that it is on HTTPS. Uh, so it has to be on a secured socket. So make sure it's running in secured mode. Um, and then another thing you could try is nuget.org. And then it's going to be, um, let's try Blazor PWA. Yeah. This package, it should get you, that package should get you um, the PWA stuff that you need. Um, I would make sure you like save and branch your, um, your repo first, because it does modify some things in your project. Um, if you're looking at getting your app to HTTPS, um, you can do that through your app settings. Uh, so I think it's going to be in properties, launch settings. Um, and then it's going to be, you want to make sure you're on a HTTPS. Um, and then I think there's something in the file dialog here, file new project that helps you set that up. You could always compare to an existing project. Um, so this, if you do a file new project and you just say configure for HTTPS, it should set one up and then you can go look at it and see the difference between your project and the one that you just created and merge in um, the, the bits that you're missing to make that configured as HTTPS. But from what I remember, it, it's going to be everything that is in your properties window. So it should be in here. You're going to want debug. Um, yeah, so in debug, there we go. You're going to want to make sure this is enabled. So that's if you're running IAS, I believe. So that's going to be your IAS config. If you're not in IAS, you're going to want to go to these properties and make sure that it is set up this way. I'm not sure how certificates are handled in that scenario. Um, I'm pretty sure that is done for you uh, through the tooling, but I can't be for certain. I can't remember exactly if it's not already doing it. I don't know how to add it other than what I just showed you. Uh, so it might take a little research, but those are some things you can look into. So this is one, enable SSL, um, make sure it's on, make sure running on the correct port uh, because it's going to be port plus one. So if you're on localhost 5000 for the regular HTTP version, it's going to be localhost 5001 if you're on SSL. Okay, so cool. Hopefully that helps you get in the right direction. Um, those things can be very tricky. Uh, I've tried to do non-Blazor PWAs from scratch, and they could be, they could be a handful. All right, let's go check out see if there's somebody we can raid. Um, it's gonna be about dinner time here. Uh, let's see. I am not seeing any other channels except for Lana Lux, so we can go raid Lana. Uh, Lana is streaming about Unity and C Sharp. She's doing some game dev. So uh, thanks everybody for uh, coming to the show. Uh, uh, GR Lurchman, thanks for the follow. I'll have to check into that bot again and see what kind of commands I can get rolling. Uh, so We'll have to research that. Um, I cannot pronounce that name, but thank you very much for, for following. And uh, Curious Drive, you see the install button already. That's good news. Looks like you fixed your problem. Um, let's go over and say hi to Lana. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Thanks, that's too broader. Go ahead and check that out, my friend. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, go say hello to Lana and uh, get.
Get some power gloves if you got them. Take care.